service. We are so glad that you are here with us this morning. We have a bunch of announcements today. Uh, there's a finance meeting at 4 o'clock tonight. Everybody's welcome to come. And there's a youth cookout at Clay and Cassandra's home tonight at 5.30. Tuesday, we continue our community Linton luncheons. Only this week, it's at Trinity. So we would love for you to join us in the fellowship hall, which is right below the sanctuary, on Tuesday from 12 to 1 for our community Linton lunch and series. Gary from uh, down the road at the Disciples Church will be the guest speaker. And uh, we will be serving soup and salad. So please come join us. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday, and the youth will have their own Easter egg hunt on Sunday night. But our children's Easter egg hunt has been postponed. Originally we said we said it was going to be on the first, but instead we're going to do it on the eighth, the day before Easter. Um, there are lots of reasons for that. One is so that next week you can bring some filled Easter eggs if you would like, <laughs> and help us have some eggs to hide for the children. We would love for your help with that. And secondly, we are in the process of interviewing for the children's director position. We have been so incredibly blessed to have Cassandra Nelson be our children's director um, for a long time. <laughs> um, but Cassandra has a full-time job, and she has a new baby, and um, she needs to let go of the children's director position. And so uh, we are postponing um, the Easter egg hunt for a week until uh, April the 8th. We are excited that Clay is going to stay as our youth director, and um, we're glad that both of you are part of our congregation. Um, the other announcement is that there is a young adult event on Friday. Uh, group of folks are going to the Druid Sea Arts Festival, and we would love for you to join us. So if you would like to go, um, just email Sadly. Her email address is on the back of the bulletin, and she'll give you all the information about that. And now Kerry has an announcement that she's going to make about our I Love Trinity building campaign. Many of you are familiar with our I Love Trinity Day, which will be coming up in April. And that's where a bunch of us get together and we basically clean the church. We clean kitchens, we um, polish brass, we work on the yard, um, we do all sorts of things. But this is an I Love Trinity building campaign, a little mini campaign in the middle of the year. So as you know, we've been having announcements about the I Love Trinity campaign for the last several weeks. It's a campaign to raise money to fund much needed repairs and maintenance for the buildings, such as these lovely glasses and um, the beautiful sanctuary doors. Um, if you haven't heard any more information, there are sheets this time where you pick up the bulletins at the front of the sanctuary. Um, but I want to give you an update on where we are today. We have a generous donor who has agreed to match all donations up to $10,000. And so far, we have raised $8,715. So with the um, donation, the matching donation, there will be $17,430, which is great. Our goal is $25,000, and we're very close to getting the $10,000 where we can take advantage of all of the matching. So thank you to those who have already contributed. We really appreciate it. And if you've been thinking about it, now would be a great time so that we can hopefully at least reach the goal to get all of the matching $10,000. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Now, if you would rise as you are able in body or spirit and look to your bulletin and join me in our call to worship as we welcome in the Lord this morning. Revitalizing God, your power goes far beyond our own. And yet, yes, still our own as though the enemies of this world are finding a claim upon us. We give in to the despair and hopelessness of death, not trusting in your ability to call forth new life from the tombs of our lives. Forgive us for doubting your power to raise up. Forgive us for wanting to limit you to the last day or the world beyond this one. Help us to trust you to move and act among us, within us, through us. Open our eyes to the wonder of new life striving into being in our very midst. Amen. 
about today. Maybe there's a person that you're worried about or a situation that you're worried about or a place that is in your prayers. And so we lift those up as well today. Perhaps there's something that you want to give thanks to God for. Maybe something really wonderful happened to you this week. Maybe there's something that you are just so excited about and joyful about. Maybe there's something beautiful that you especially noticed this week. Whatever your prayers are, I invite you to let them all bubble up to the surface as we sing together. And then we will offer all of our prayers to God. Our call to prayer is Spirit of the God in number 393. And we will sing that chorus to the twice.
are you guys this morning? Fine. Good. Let me ask you a question. You guys like animals? Yes. Do you do? Oh, sounds like a resounding yes. Do you have any favorite animals? Yes. What What are some of your favorite animals? Talk some sense into him. 
the donkey has to point out to him, well, have I ever behaved strange this way before? Have I ever behaved strangely? Don't you think I might have a reason? And he was like, oh, I guess that's a good point. And then God lets him see the angel. So now, now the man can see what the donkey has been able to see the whole time. And he realizes that his donkey was just trying to keep him safe because his donkey loved him. Even, even though he apparently didn't deserve it, he wasn't too, you know, too nice to his donkey. But, but, uh, but the angel tells him, you're lucky that your donkey just saved your life forever. <laughs> um, you're lucky that this animal was here because uh, I, I would have stopped you had you moved forward. But it's a good thing. It's a good thing you had your animal companion because animals are important, aren't they? They're, yeah, they're important for the world. They're important to us. But aren't, aren't, aren't you glad that we have animals? But yeah. would you guys say a prayer for me? Lord Jesus. We thank you for animal friends and that you love everything you've made. Amen. Gracious God, we know that some folks are struggling financially right now. And we know there are others of us that have more than we need. So God, we give back to you a portion of what you've given us. And we ask that you bless it and multiply it. And help it to be used in such a way that it brings you glory, that it helps your children, and that it makes this world a better place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
is from the book of John, chapter 11. There once was a man named Lazarus, and he had two sisters, Mary and Martha. You may remember them from Luke 10. Martha was the one who was busy in the kitchen working and preparing and serving, and Mary was the one sitting at the feet of Jesus when they got into an argument with one another. Well, their brother Lazarus became deathly ill, and they sent word to Jesus, saying, the one that you love is sick. Well, when Jesus got the message, he said to those around him, sickness will not bring death. It will bring glory to God through God's Son. Now, Jesus loved Lazarus and Mary and Martha, but he stayed two more days where he was. And after two days, he turned to his disciples and he said, let's go back to Judea. Well, the disciples looked at him and said, but we were just there, and the Jewish people tried to, to stone you, and you want us to go back? And Jesus says, there are 12 hours of daylight. Those who walk in the light will not stumble, but those who walk in the dark will stumble. Our friend Lazarus is asleep, and I will wake him up. And the disciples said, Lord, if he's asleep, he'll be fine. And Jesus said, let me clarify, Lazarus is not asleep, he's dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there, because now you'll have a chance to put your faith in me. Let's go to him. And Thomas, the ever-practical one, says, well, then let us all go and die with him. Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. Many neighbors and friends had come to comfort Mary and Martha. Jesus and the disciples were within a couple of miles of the, of the house when they heard that Jesus was near. And so Martha ran out to meet Jesus where he was. And the first thing she said to him was, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. I know that even now God will give you whatever you want. And Jesus looked at her and said, your brother will rise again. And Martha said, I know he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection. And I am the life. Whoever believes in me will live, even though they die. Do you believe this? She said, yes, Lord. I, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Then Martha went to her sister Mary, and she said to Mary, the teacher is here, and he's asking for you. Well, Jesus was still a ways off from the village, and Mary was in the house, but she jumped up and she left, and all of her friends who were there accompanying her assumed that she was going to the tomb to mourn. And when Mary saw Jesus, she fell at his feet, and she also said, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus saw her crying, along with everyone else. He was deeply moved and troubled. Where have you laid him? Come and see, she said. And Jesus wept. Some of the people around him said, see how he loved him. But others said, he healed the blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? Jesus again was deeply moved. And he came to the entrance of the tomb. And he said to them, take the stone away. And Martha, the practical one, said, Lord, that will be a bad smell. He's been in there for four days. And Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? And Jesus prayed, Father, I thank you that you hear me. I know that you always hear me. But I say this for the benefit of others, so that they will know that you sent me. And Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and his feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus turned to the people around him and said, Unbind him and let him go. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In a year or so, my son will begin to look at colleges, and I have no idea where he might want to go. When I was in high school in Tuscaloosa, pretty much everybody I knew went to the University of Alabama, or they went to Shelton and then the University of Alabama. I heard about this small liberal arts college in Birmingham through camp, Birmingham Southern College. And so I knew that I would either go to UA or to Birmingham Southern. It never occurred to me that there were other schools in the state. 
It never occurred to me that there were colleges and universities outside of the state. No one limited my thinking. No one said, oh, well, you can't go here. Or you can't consider this. Um, it was just outside of my imagination. It was just outside of my experience to even consider going someplace other than one of those two places. My thinking was pretty small and pretty narrow. Decades later, I would be the campus minister at Jacksonville State University, and Piedmont uh, High School invited me to come and speak at their breakfast for their graduating seniors. So, as a campus minister, what do you think I talked about? I talked about the transition to college and where they could find support and what that would be like and, you know, what it's like to start college and um, uh, did my whole spiel. It did not go over really well. I couldn't figure out why. And afterwards, I was sitting at the table with a bunch of the students eating breakfast. And I said, so, where are you going after, after you graduate? And the first student said, well, I'm going to go work on my parents' farm. They need some help, and I'm going to learn their business and take over that business. Oh, that's great. Well, what about you? Where are you going? Well, I've already enlisted, and I'm going into the military. Wow. Well, that's really great, too. Well, what about you? Well, I have an apprenticeship, uh, an apprenticeship lined up with a plumber, because plumbers make good money, and it's a good job, and I'm going to learn how to be a plumber. And I said, that is awesome. And I realized that, you know, there's so many options outside of college, but my thinking was so small. I didn't even consider the possibilities of where lots of these students would choose to go when they graduated. I suppose we all get stuck in our own little worldview sometimes. I mean, we only know what we know, and it's hard to think outside of our own box. Sometimes our world becomes really small. Sometimes it even becomes like a little prison because we can't imagine more. We can't imagine something bigger. Sometimes by circumstance or choice, we end up in our little boxes like a cave or even like a tomb. And we can't imagine life in any different. Jesus asked a lot of his disciples and friends when he asked them to think outside their box, when he challenged their preconceptions, when he gave them new experiences. A lot of them had already been traveling with Jesus to places they had never been before. And they met people that they would not have ordinarily even talked with. They had seen miracles beyond their wildest dreams. But now Jesus was telling them, hey, I'm going to go heal a dead guy. That must have sounded absolutely absurd. They were risking their life to return to Judea for Jesus to heal a dead man. You know, you're either dead or you're not, right? You know? And poor Thomas, he was like, fine, then we will go with you and we will be dead like Lazarus will be dead. The disciples understood the power of death and darkness and they knew that there was no escape. There was no escaping that. Poor Mary and Martha cried out to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, which is really a statement of, of faith. If you had been here, I know that you would have the power to have healed him, but it was also an accusation. If you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. I imagine they were thinking, why did you not come? Were you not listening? Did you not care? Were strangers more important than the ones you love? Didn't you know how much we needed? How could you have let this happen? I'm guessing many of us have voiced in the darkest nights of our souls, Lord, if you had been here, my loved one would not have died. Or if you were real, if you were real God, that bad thing would not have happened. But if the story doesn't answer the why God doesn't fix everything for us, it does answer the where. Where God is when we are suffering. God is walking near us, inviting us to follow, kneeling and weeping with us when we are in pain, joining us at the tomb when we are numb and paralyzed with grief, and calling us out of the darkness into the light, leading us from death into a new life. Now, as Christians, we believe in life after death. We believe in the kingdom of heaven. We believe that one day when we die, our spirits will be united with God and all of our loved ones who have gone before us. 
We are confident about our physical death and life afterwards in heaven. But we know that our physical death is not the only time we die. We die a thousand deaths in our lifetime. Every time a dream dies, something in us dies. When tragedy strikes, when our children move out, when our job ends, life is filled with all sorts of little deaths along the way. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The contemporary English version says, I am the one who raises the dead to life. Do you notice what Jesus didn't say in that passage? He doesn't say, I will be the resurrection and the life. He says, I am. I am the one who raises the dead to life. We can believe in and proclaim the resurrection and death uh, after death. Absolutely. We are an Easter people. But we can also believe and proclaim in the saving power of resurrection on this side of life as well, even in the many deaths that we experience. Jesus and the crowd go to the tomb, and Jesus says, take away the stone. Lazarus is in the grave, in the darkness. And even Martha says, Lord, he's been buried four days. There is no life. There is no hope. There is no next. There's only a bad smell. And Jesus says, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? And then he prays, I thank you, God, that you heard me. I know that you always hear us. But I say this for the crowd so that they might believe that you sent me. And he cried in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And at that moment, many people saw the glory of God as Lazarus came out of the tomb, still wrapped in cloths, his hand and his feet, still bound, still with a cloth over his head, still seeing only darkness. Unbind him, Jesus says to the crowd. Unbind him and let him go. Poor Lazarus at the center of a miracle and he doesn't even know it yet. All he sees is darkness because his eyes are covered. He can't move because his hands and his feet are bound at the center of a miracle and he doesn't even know it yet. It reminds me of the women who go to the tomb after Jesus has been crucified. And they find that the tomb is empty. And what they didn't know is that God was at work in the darkness. God works best in the dark places. And the resurrection had happened. And the women didn't even know it yet. They didn't even know it. So Jesus says to the crowd, you unbind him and let him go. We will meet many people who have been bound or who are bound, bound by their own prejudices, bound by fear and anxiety, bound by addictions or physical challenges, bound by a job or a relationship that's killing them. We all know people who are living in the shadow of death. And Jesus says to us, you unbind them. Go unbind them and let them go. Jesus gives us the power and the command to unbind others. And so we do. We step up. Friends and church family gather around to hand out tissues, to give out water, to send food, to wrap others in hymns and prayers, to share tears and stories and laughter, and finally unbind one another from the terrible grip of the shadow of life. New life right now. A resurrection right now, even when the darkness is all that some people can see. I have a friend going through treatment, and she says, you know what, every day is not a good day. But there is good in every day. Every day is not a good day, but there is good in every day. There is joy in every day. There is life and beauty in every day. When we are broken, when we're standing in the darkness, it's at the mouth of the tomb where we fall on our knees groaning and weeping 
And that's where Jesus shows up. Our God makes miracles and brings life out of death, takes us from the shadows of death and calls us into the light of the resurrection. Jesus bids us to leave the darkness. Jesus bids us to unbind those who can only see darkness and fear around them. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. This is the joy that comes from the invitation to share Christ's resurrection power in this life and in the next. Jesus says to us, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even though they die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Amen. If you would look to your hymnal one more time, our final hymn this morning is In the Garden. 